The U.S. has now withdrawn 90 percent of its troops from Afghanistan. The Pentagon says that it now plans to have all American forces out of the country by the end of next month. That latest announcement comes two months ahead of that September 11th deadline set by President Biden. But the resurgence of Taliban fighters in Afghanistan is raising concerns. Nearly 1,000 Afghan soldiers have fled across the border to Tajikistan. Officials fear the militant group will overrun the country once the U.S. withdraws entirely. For more, I want to bring in Nancy Youssef. She's a national security correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Nancy, thank you for being here. Um, you know, as troops exit Afghanistan, the U.S. is actually having to reevaluate its security at its embassy in Kabul. How are they preparing for a possible evacuation? So what we've heard is that the U.S. plans to keep hundreds of troops in Afghanistan and a bid to secure that uh, embassy in Kabul so that they can sustain operations. But one of the challenges that we're seeing is that there, are, as the Taliban advances into other parts of Afghanistan, there are worries that in a matter of weeks or months, we could see the Taliban moving into Kabul. And in that situation, the, the embassy becomes a very big target. And so in a bid to keep its personnel safe, we are hearing reports of um, plans to strengthen the size of the embassy staff and to beef up security at the airport in Kabul where and any evacuation would happen. And, and Nancy, can you give us kind of a sense of what exactly the resurgence of the Taliban actually looks like as the U.S. withdraws? Sure. It's, it's actually very interesting because what we've seen is in the run up to the U.S. Um, withdrawal from Afghanistan, we saw Taliban fighters positioned outside of provincial capitals. And in the last few weeks, they started in the north, where they have the least sort of amount of influence and have tried to move into those provincial capitals, move into districts in some cases, and have taken over over 100 districts. And, and on all, they have um, control in about a third of the country. And so now we're seeing them actually try to advance on districts. We saw this in Western Afghanistan today. In some cases, they're going to prisons and releasing inmates, many of them Taliban supporters. Um, there are reports of looting of, of military um, posts. There's report of looting residents' home and tribal leaders' homes, and this sort of uh, district by district move through Afghanistan, starting in the north, um, an area where a lot of the Afghan government comes from, and presumably moving eventually south and east in, in, a, in a push to t reclaim parts of the country. The last places that we would assume that they would go after are big cities where they're likely to face the most resistance. And Nancy, as we we're talking about this policy and, and this withdrawal, you know, I can't help but think of some of the human aspects of this. And I've been thinking a lot, too, about, you know, this Afghan interpreters, a lot of them who have put their lives on the line for years and years to help American forces. Um, what does the future really look like for them at this point? It's such an important point because there's at least 16,000 um, interpreters who've worked with um, various military forces and other government agencies and have been a keystone to U.S. operations in Afghanistan, often unrecognized but are truly essential to how the U.S. military has been able to conduct the war there. Um, the, the problem is that they are under threat. Many feel under threat. We've seen the assassination of some um, at least two a month. Uh, since the beginning of the year. And their real fear is that as the Taliban moves into other parts of the country, they will go after uh, translators for their willingness to work with, um, with the United States and its coalition partners. The U.S. has said that it will bring um, those translators and their families out, but the specifics on how that happens remains unclear. There have been suggestions that some of the translators could be moved to Guam, Qatar, UAE, as their paperwork is processed. Remember that the average process can take about 900 days, and so that'll be well beyond when the final U.S. troop leaves. And so there are sort of two plans happening. One is to potentially move them into a country while they wait, and then to go through that visa process. But um, it, it, one could argue that it's not just important for those translators, but I think it, how they're treated and how much effort is made to secure them will signal to U.S. partners going forward um, what it will do for those who agree to work with them and in and, and other parts of the world. Mm, yeah, so longer-term impact in that regard, too. And, you know, broadly speaking, can you give us a sense of, you know, what the legacy is of 20 years of American involvement in Afghanistan? 
It's such a great question. And it's the question that you hear in Afghanistan being asked everywhere amongst troops, amongst residents. What 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 is the legacy of of this war? I think one could argue that in the more urban areas, we've seen a real change in the life of, of the average Afghan, that they've been exposed to a lot of things that potentially they wouldn't. But at the same time, that despite billions, if, if not trillions of dollars being invested in Afghanistan, the ability to build a security force that can protect the country against the Taliban and groups like the Islamic State hasn't hasn't come to be. And so uh, the, the question becomes, is Afghanistan um, s such that it won't be a safe haven for, for terrorists going forward? Remember, the war started because it was a safe haven for the 9-11 attackers. And if it's not, is it acceptable that it's a country where terror groups are allowed to operate and pose threats to uh, U.S. allies and partners? And so one of the things you hear when you talk to Afghans, or in my experience, interviewing Afghans, and, and veterans and U.S. service members is a real grappling with this question after 20 years, given the inability to point to a clear outcome. Uh, it's a real question that's sort of weighing on people's minds because what, what what's ahead is uncertain and it has um, the spectrum of possibilities from an Afghan government that is able to sustain the threat from, from the Taliban to potentially a rapid takeover of the country by the Taliban. And, and even more than that, that the, the Taliban could be fighting for parts of the country for a long period of time, that you could have rival um, terrorist groups fighting for control of parts of the country. So it's the uncertainty after 20 years that I think is really vexing for those who have been so committed to to this, uh, to this Afghanistan to, to trying to get it to a better place than what it was in October 2001 when the war started. Such a long period of time, and it was so striking when Biden announced the policy. You know, he mentioned that there are soldiers fighting who were not even born uh, yet on 9-11. So, really puts that into perspective. And as you mentioned, the lingering impact that uh, that this will uh, that this will have. Nancy Youssef, thank you so much for your reporting and for joining us. Thanks for having me.